I'm Katie Couric. Good news tonight in the battle against a killer. Fewer women are hearing these four words. You have breast cancer. Sharon Alfonsi on what may be the reason for a sharp decline. 7% is really huge. Cheryl Atkinson has the latest on the condition of Senator Tim Johnson as Gloria Borger looks at what is now a very delicate balance of power on Capitol Hill. And new hope in the search for three missing mountain climbers. Could a cell phone signal mean they're alive? This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Hi, everyone. It kills more than 40,000 women in this country every single year. But as we mentioned, there is good news about breast cancer, the number two cancer killer of women. Tonight, we can tell you that breast cancer rates are suddenly dropping. And as Sharon Alfonsi tells us, scientists are trying to figure out why. Doctors sometimes use a magnifying glass to look for breast cancer. Now, some new cancer statistics are under the same scrutiny. After years of only fractional changes, researchers say suddenly the incidence of breast cancer dropped 7% in a single year. This is an enormous decrease. Researchers announced today that decrease may be linked to hormone replacement pills. In 2002, a federal study linked the hormones to cancer and heart disease. Millions of women stopped using them. A year later, the incidence of breast cancer nosedived. Dr. Peter Rabdin led the analysis of the 2003 statistics, the most complete data available. His study suggests that breast cancer tumors may be fueled by hormone replacement therapy. And when that was stopped, those cancers almost immediately stopped growing. But Dr. Freya Schnabel says stopping hormone therapy may be just one of the reasons for the dramatic decrease that year. Better mammograms could play a part too. If one thing is true, it's that breast cancer is just not that simple. So while it's encouraging news for millions of women. And I like to get rid of some of this gray. And it's still not that clear cut. Very confusing for women because no one seems to have um, the right answers or concrete information. About 10 years ago, an increase in breast cancer was widely reported. Doctors later learned it was the result of better detection, not a bigger problem. The lesson? Sometimes you have to wait a few years to see how the statistics shake out. Sharon Alfonsi, CBS News, New York. Dr. John LaPook is our CBS News medical correspondent. John, this is bound to add to the confusion people already have about hormone replacement. When that Women's Health Initiative came out four years ago and showed an increase in the risk of breast cancer, many people said, we're not doing hormone replacement. Right. Do you think that this will only add to those fears? Well, it's such a complicated subject and it definitely needs further study. But I spoke to three experts today and here's the bottom line that they said. The studies from four years ago were in women who were older, in their mid-60s, taking a relatively higher dose of estrogen for about five years. And the thinking now is that in a subset of patients of women with symptoms of menopause who are not at increased risk for side effects, that it's very reasonable to give a relatively lower dose of hormones for, say, a few years and see what happens. And who don't have a history of breast cancer either, that, right? Yeah, those would be the increased risks of problems. All right, Dr. John LaPook, stick around because we have another major medical story we're covering, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It's the Sudden illness of Democratic Senator Tim Johnson of South Dakota, who had emergency brain surgery last night, and there are implications for the delicate balance of power in Congress. Johnson is now listed in critical condition. Cheryl Atkinson on Capitol Hill has the very latest. After surgery that went well past midnight last night, Senator Tim Johnson's family released a statement saying he had suffered sudden bleeding in his brain. The symptoms first surfaced during a telephone conference call with reporters yesterday. The money was, was uh, proposed to be uh, uh, provided uh, a year ago. In the middle of answering a question, Johnson starts to falter. Uh, you know, you, you, <laughs> it, it, it just is, is, is frustrating. That, after AIDS ended the call, Johnson managed to walk to his Capitol office but still appeared ill. An ambulance rushed him to the hospital. The diagnosis, an arteriovenous malformation in his brain. 
That means arteries and veins are knotted together like a ball of yarn. He's probably had it but not known it for much of his life. As the tangle grew, one of the blood vessels apparently burst. It really depends on the size and location, how much injury to the brain is done at the time of the hemorrhage, and that can be everywhere from mild to severe. Last night's surgery to drain the blood is being called successful, but nobody's saying much beyond that, including Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who visited Johnson today. My sign looked great. Johnson, who's been a senator for a decade, fought off prostate cancer in 2004. Married with three children, he voted in 2003 to authorize military force in Iraq, knowing it would send his oldest son, Brooks, an army sergeant, to the region. He since returned safely. Late today, we were told Senator Johnson has been appropriately responsive to word and touch and that no further surgery has been required. Also, Katie, that it's too early for a long-term prognosis. All right, Cheryl Atkinson on Capitol Hill tonight. For most of us, this is the first time we have ever heard of the condition Senator Johnson has. So let's go back to our go-to guy, Dr. John LaPoo. John, how might this medical event affect Senator Johnson's health in the long run? It depends on exactly what's going on, which we really do not know. However, just to look at how things like this happen in other patients, this is a schematic of the brain, and this is the area of the brain where speech and communication is involved. Now, if you go back to sort of a slice through the brain to see of the kind of things that can go on when you have these abnormal blood vessels called AVMs, here you have one in the front part of the brain, and if these were to bleed, you could actually have problem with thinking and with movement. This is in an area that affects communication and speech. And theoretically, again, we don't know exactly what's going on, but theoretically, if you had a problem like bleeding here, you could have symptoms such as the kind of symptoms that the senator had. John, can patients like this experience a full recovery? I spoke to two experts at Columbia today, and the answer is absolutely yes. We don't know, again, the specifics of the senator's situation, so we can't say anything about him. But in general, patients can make a complete and total recovery. Dr. John LaPook, thanks for all your help tonight. <laughs> Politics don't matter much in news of life or death, but when it broke yesterday that the Democratic senator was ill, there was immediate speculation about the impact it might have on the balance of power in the new Senate, where Democrats will soon hold the slimmest of majorities, 51 to 49. National political correspondent Gloria Borger is in our Washington bureau tonight. Gloria, what are people down there saying now? Well, Katie, one thing did become very clear today, and that is Republicans are staying very far away from the conversation about just who's going to control the Senate, at least for now. As one Republican said to me, and I quote, this is not the way we want to win back the Senate. And there's one more thing to keep in mind here, Katie, and that is that never in history has a sitting senator been told to leave the premises because of his health. And we have one current example. That's Senator Joe Biden of Delaware. In 1988, he had a brain aneurysm. He was out of the Senate for seven months. But, Katie, he's back in the Senate today. All right, Gloria Borger in Washington. Thank you, Gloria. And now to the search for the three climbers missing on Oregon's Mount Hood. National Guard helicopters, even a C-130 cargo plane, have now joined the effort. At the base of the mountain where families and rescue teams wait, a single electronic ping is keeping hope alive tonight. Jerry Bowen reports. Despite fierce 100-mile-an-hour winds and near whiteout conditions that have stalled rescue efforts on Mount Hood, Hopes have been raised by reports that a cell phone used by missing climber Kelly James was briefly turned back on late Tuesday night. My heart was in my throat when I heard that, because if it's true, it means that Kelly is alive uh, and that he has his wits about him. James used the phone Sunday to notify his family he'd taken refuge in a snow cave, while his colleagues Brian Hall and Jerry Cook were going down the mountain for help. T-Mobile has been trying to reestablish contact with the phone ever since, sending a signal, pinging it routinely every five minutes. Tuesday, the phone signaled back that it was on before falling silent again. Other high-tech efforts to locate the missing trio, unmanned drones to heat sensors, have been grounded by the brutal weather. The hope is all are in snow caves that could keep them warm and alive. They could be up at the top with Mr. James. They could be in a snow cave down lower. That's why we're kind of continuing some of our lower elevation searches. Karen James, for one, has no doubt her husband is coming down. 
my husband proposed to me on Mount Rainier, and we're planning our 50th wedding anniversary there, so I know he's coming off this mountain. But with more bad weather moving in, searchers say it may be the weekend before they can get closer to the stranded climbers. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Los Angeles. And there's much more CBS News ahead. Coming up next, is the U.S. Army being stretched to the breaking point? A dire warning from the top general.